We're at Philippians and we left off at chapter 3, verse 13. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Fresh review for some of you who don't know. Remember, we were talking about your salvation, your completion, your perfection, your eternal life, where you're already perfect. Amen? If you're saved in Jesus Christ, you're already perfect. But then the confusion lies with verses where it shows that Paul is striving for perfection even though he's supposed to be already perfect. So this doesn't make sense. So I'm going to draw it out for you so that you can understand. Remember this is that we are already perfect in Christ. But the perfection can have different levels. All right? Your salvation and then your works are built upon it. And then Paul saying that's why he strives for perfection. Why? Because he's already perfect, but he's trying to grow in his perfection. He's going through different levels over here of perfection. It's like I have good health, all right? Or perfect health. So let's say that you have very good health, but then people, they still want to be healthier, right? So then they go on different levels in being healthier. It's like not just health, let's talk about clean water, all right? So then there's such a thing as, hey, I got clean water, but we could have probably a more advanced purifier system and we can go in different levels of a clean water to drink, right? Uh, the Bible shows that the word of the Lord's are pure words, kind of like pure water. But notice the Bible says that uh, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. So the word of God is pure, but God can purify it more if he wants to. That's important to understand. So if we were to understand this, then we would understand about eternal life. We would understand about uh, perfection, where God, uh, where God talks about that you're already perfect, that you already have eternal life. However, you can grow in it. You're striving to be more perfect. You're striving so that you can have more within eternal life, which is what? The inheritance, the rewards. So that should be very, very clear. So that's why Paul says, I apprehended, but I did not apprehend. What did that mean? That means that he already attains perfection, but he did not attain as much as he wants within the level of perfection. Okay? So that's how we are to understand about these levels. If we were to take it that way, then we would really understand. Now, we understand the context here. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3. And then I want you to look at verse 13. Brethren, so Paul is speaking to the saved Christians. He calls them brethren. I count not myself to have apprehended. So Paul's saying that I did not apprehend. All right, so that means that he did not attend, attain. He did not fully grasp, right? So he... He doesn't count himself as one who fully grasps about his what? His perfection, his salvation that the Lord has given to him, his high calling. If we were to keep reading, the Bible says, but this one thing I do, there is one thing that Paul's do Paul does though, even though he does not think himself as one that he fully apprehended it. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. That's so important. So Paul's saying, I forget the things that are behind me. The past is the past. What I reach forth, what I go for and try to grab is the things that are before me. So in other words, in front of me. It's before me, right? This object is before me. Amen. So in other words, it's in front of me. It doesn't mean behind. It means in front. So that's what Paul's goal is. Paul's goal is to, even though he says, look, and this might be some of you, I may not 
apprehend what I am. I may not have fully grasped my perfection as much as I want to, but this is the thing that I do. That's what he worded it as, right? This is one thing that he does. And that's so important for you to understand. What you need to do is what? It's not that, oh, I'll never be as perfect as I want to be. You know, that's the problem with some of you Christians. You get discouraged in your Christian walk. When you have salvation, you're not growing as much as you should with the salvation that you have inside of you. So that's what can make you discouraged. But you got to realize this. For doing, it's not that you try to discourage yourself or pressure yourself that you keep pushing, 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 and then you feel de defeated. The key is this. The key is no matter how many times you backslide or mess up, it's forgetting those things which are behind Amen. and reaching forth those things which are before, forward, okay? So that's what the Christian walk is about. It's don't think about, don't think about, oh man, there's so many things that I have to do and look at my situation, I've fallen behind. See, that's your problem. You're looking at your past, right? Paul says, I'm not looking at my past. So you you got to stop looking at your past. You can't look at, oh, I'm over here, Amen. right? When you do that, then that's why you've, uh, when, you, when you say, I did not fully grasp the situation, I did not apprehend, you get discouraged, you can't stay over here. Even though you did not fully grasp, what you've got to do is look at the prize in front of you. If you look at the very next verse, it's the prize that Paul is talking about. He's looking in front of him. Look, I want to get that crown. Look, all you have to do is think about when, wow, I, I, I wish uh, that's what I want. I want to see souls get saved. I want to uh, be a great disciple for the Lord. I want to serve Him faithfully. I want to be a Christian who gets victory over sin. I want to please Jesus Christ. You know, you have to look in front of you what you could be. When you do that, then that encourages you to keep pressing forward. It's like working out, right? When you're working out, you're not getting discouraged about uh, your defeated modes or when you skip exercise and, oh, look how heavy I am. No, what you're doing is you're looking in front of you. Man, I want to work out like that. I want to be like that, you know? When you keep doing that, then that motivates you to keep going forward. Amen. So what you got to do is not look at your current level and how it matches up with the uh, front and the past. No, you got to just keep looking forward. When you just keep looking forward, what happens is you're not looking at yourself where you're at. And when you just keep going forward, you're not looking at, oh, I'm here, I'm here. No, no, you just keep looking forward. And then what happens is when you reach so forward and you start looking at the past, you go, wow, I grew so much. Isn't that some of you saved Christians? Amen. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Do you remember some of you when, before you came to this church, what you were like? Some of you who've been here for years now? I mean, if you were to now look behind you, you grew a lot. And the important thing was you just kept pressing forward. That's the idea. You just kept looking forward. I want to be the one that's able to win a soul. I want to be the one that's able to finally read through my Bible. I want to be the one that knows a lot of doctrine. And So just keep looking at that. And then what happens is don't look at your current situation or your past and feel defeated. Just keep looking forward. What happens, it naturally grows. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So when you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, past is past and forget about the past. You're a new creature in Christ. So when Paul talks about forgetting those things in the past and going forward, you can imagine that his past was haunting him about the people that he tortured. The Christians that he tortured when he was a lost, unbelieving Jew. But then he didn't let his lost, unsaved life haunt him. That's what a lot of you are doing, right? You don't let your lost, unsaved life haunt you. 
You're saying, look, I'm a Bible believer now. I'm a Christian. I just, hey, pastor, uh, I want to know how to win a soul to salvation. I want to know how to preach. I want to know how, what more I can do for the Lord. That's what you're all doing right now, right? Now look at 1 John 1. 1 John 1. So we can see this happening concerning about the past of your unbelieving life. But it's very important that you are thinking about your current life right now too. You're a saved Christian and then it's easy to look at the past as a saved Christian on your little beginnings or on your defeat. Look at 1 John 1. Paul, he can't when he's talking about not looking behind him, he's talking about his un, I mean he, he's talking about his unbelieving life. He's talking about his current Christian walk as well. And that's what you all have to do. No matter how many times you fail your Bible reading prayer or your church attendance, you can't let that bother you. No matter how many times you fell into the same sin again, you can't look at the past. You've got to keep looking forward. Amen. I want victory. I want to grow in the Lord. Notice this is the Christian walk here. The Christian walk, Christian fellowship. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And then when you're walking in Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. So you have to believe in His promise that all sin in your Christian walk, that God will clear it with His blood if you confess it. So, I mean, confession and repentance may be multiple times a day and you feel like it's vain words, but look, just keep trying to put your heart into it, just confess it under the blood, try repenting, and the Lord will honor it. No matter what, He'll be faithful. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's how you can not let the past haunt you in your Christian walk. All right? Just keep going forward. Just kept, keep pressing forward, forward. Just keep looking forward. Okay. Next one, uh, go back to Philippians. Go back to Philippians. Go to Philippians 3 again. Now let's look at verse 14. Verse 14. Now, if you recall uh, last Philippians study, all of this is known as the Christian race. It's the Christian race. So within the Christian race, what we are supposed to do is to keep pressing forward and not go backwards. When Paul says that I'm perfect, but I'm not that perfect, what he means by that is he's talking about, he's looking everything at the perspective of the race. So all of this is tied to the Christian race. When you get your inheritance, when you grow more in your perfection, when you grow more in your eternal life with its reward and inheritance, all of that is known as a race. We all have our pace, right, that we go by. So that's why it's a race. We see right here, verse 14, I press toward the mark. So, Paul's saying, I'm pressing toward, remember he's saying forward, right? At the previous verse. So, he's pressing toward the mark. So, that's undoubtedly a race right here. In the race you hear, on your marks, get set, go, right? So, he's pressing toward his own mark right here for the prize. So, see, he's racing for that prize. He wants that prize. I told you so that even though you're perfect in your salvation, that don't mean that you can get as much of your prize or in your inheritance and your rewards that you want, right? So that's why you have to work for it. You have to work for it. It's not an automatic uh, gift card that God just gives to you. You have to work for it. Keep reading. Uh, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So then right here, notice you're in Christ Jesus when you're saved. You already know that. So if you're in Christ Jesus, now you have to press toward that, uh, that prize. And that prize and those rewards come from God calling you of the high calling of God. God has given each and every one of you a high calling. 
And as I've mentioned to you before, the high calling, you may not really what? At verse 12, you may not have really... Uh, Paul mentions the last part. If that, uh, in verse 12, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. See, that's what's referring to his high calling. Jesus Christ knows and fully grasps about Paul, how he can use him, even though Paul doesn't. So that's the same thing that I encouraged you, if you recall, that all of you have a special high calling from God when you got saved. And even though you may not fully grasp or fully understand the situation, God does. So, because God knows how He's going to use you in the future, who knows what you might become. You might be big, you might be popular, you might be a big preacher, you might just be a nobody but have created great sacrifice for the Lord and planted a lot of seeds. But God's creating you for something high. He has a high calling, something great in your, each and every one of your life. Amen. And remember, you may not really apprehend or grasp that, but Christ does, according to verse 12 that we looked at before in our last Philippian study. So that's why you have to press forward for that, all right? Press forward for what? The high calling that God called you to be. That's what I did. Uh, my life verse, if you, some of you didn't know, was, uh, we're going to look at this passage, actually. We're going to look at it. Look at 1 Corinthians. This was my life verse, actually. It was 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, there are three places we're going to go. 1 Corinthians 9, Hebrews 12, and 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, Hebrews 12. Again, Hebrews 12, 2 Timothy 4. And then the other one is 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. These three passages are written by Paul. And Paul, all he's focusing is on the Christian race. Now, I am what I am today, not because I'm a great guy. But if there's anything great in me, it's only because of Jesus Christ. And what I did was, I could not look at my past. I could not look at the smallness of of my church size or how other pastors or older people might look down on me because of my young age and what I had to do was I just kept looking forward like Lord I want to be that great preacher that you've called me to be that was my calling I was like Lord I want to set the whole world on fire I had a big vision and when I had that in mind I did not think about like I would be a DL Moody with uh, so many people on the altar and thousands in my church I didn't think of it that way. I was thinking that it could just be me and one person. Me and one person. But still, I'm going to do something big for him. I could be one pastor all alone or even a nobody, but I'd be the one who'd pass out millions of tracts, for example, or witness to thousands of souls, right? The Lord has something great for all of us, all right? He's going to utilize our gift. We don't know what it is, but it will. And that was my vision. I was like, Lord, I have a vision that I'm going to be uh, this great as you want me to be. I'm going to create the greatest church, the great, become the greatest pastor. Not because I'm prideful and I can boast I'm better than them, but that every single pastor should have that in mind. Every church should have that in my, mind. We want to be the best church, the greatest church. Uh, I, if the Lord calls you to preach, I want to be the greatest preacher. You should have that in mind. Amen. Why? Because you want to be the best for the Lord. Amen. And if you have that in mind, then what happens? See? You're not looking at your current situation. You just keep looking at that. And then what happens? You grow. Right. You grow. And that's what made me what I am today now, you see. But guess what? I didn't stop. I still am looking forward. Because I ain't the greatest preacher. There are plenty of greater preachers out there than yours truly. Greater teachers than out there than yours truly. So what do I do? I keep striving onward. And that makes me greater. And that should be the same thing with this church too. Let's look at this one. This was my life verse. I have to work if I'm going to get it. You earn when you work for it. Okay? That's what Paul's encouraging you to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So there's a whole bunch of people running to get that prize. So run that ye may obtain. That's what I did. I, I, I worked my butt off uh, in a church at its beginnings, driving 
hours doing full-time college and full-time ministry, squeezing through exams. If I want to attend the revival meetings, I would bring my school textbooks with me during break time and read the school textbooks while being in the revival meetings at other churches. I worked my tail off. And guess what? I obtained it. Amen. When you work it, when you work, you have to earn something. That was my life first. But now my life first changed. It changed to this now. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. Verse 7. What? I've, I want to have a mindset now of completing my course now. Because why? I've grown now. I've grown to this point now. 2 Timothy 4 7. I have fought a good fight. I have what? Finish my course. See, I'm finishing my race now, the course of my race. Now that's my goal. Why? Because I ran hard and I got a lot from the Lord. Now I want to finish well my course. Look at verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. See that? You're getting your prize when you run in your race. I told you so. So you have to do this. You have to work for it. Don't be a hyper-dispensationalist thinking that there's nothing that you have to work for or do that, oh, once you're saved, you're complete and you have everything and you're going to get your rewards. No, that's not how it works. You have to work for your reward. All right, let's look at uh, Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. And then we're going to look at verse 1. Verse 1. Notice right here, Paul says again, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. See that? So you have to look at the race. And verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. See, Paul, he was looking what's in front of him. Like, I want to make Jesus happy at the judgment seat of Christ. I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to get some kind of reward. Well, I messed up a lot. See, you're looking at the past. No, look at Ford. Like, at least one crown, at least one smile from his face, at least two remarks, good job. You don't have to look at all the past and all your failures. Look forward what the prize, the prize, the reward. When you do that, you tend to sin less, fail less, and you tend to achieve more. But when you focus more on your failures, then you tend to fail more. When you look at your past, you tend to fail more. So remember that. These are very important verses that you should remember. That way you can get your reward at the judgment seat of Christ. You know how you do it? Don't look at your current status. Just look forward. That's it. Don't look at your current status or your past. Just go forward and just go forward. And then at the finish line, at the judgment seat of Christ, you'd be surprised how far you made it. Okay, that's extremely important. That's how you're going to earn your rewards. I know I'm spending a long time parking here, but I'm giving you one of the secrets to get a lot of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? So this will be very helpful for you. Just keep pressing forward. Just press forward. Okay? Amen. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. Hey man, I was the one thinking that uh, our church is going to shake up the community. We're going to shake up the world. I don't know how, but we're going to do it. And I was doing it with two people. And I did it when I grew and lost people and dropped down to two. But I didn't lose my vision. Amen. Okay? So if you keep having that in mind, you'd be surprised what the Lord will bless you. Alright, good. Let's look at Philippians 3. Philippians 3 verse 15. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. So Paul's saying, what, let us now, therefore, because explaining verse 13, 14 about the race. So therefore, what should we do? Let us what? Mind, right? Be thus minded. We have to think. We have to think and mind on what? As many as be perfect, because we are perfect. So Paul's saying, because we are perfect Christians... What we now should be is we should mind about what? Striving for perfection at verse 13, 14. Now that's not a contradiction. Remember, what does that mean? Look at this again. Because we are perfect when we got saved, all right, we have to now strive in these levels of perfection, right? We have to be now more perfect. That's the idea. So now that we're perfect, we have to be thus minded. Minded about what? 
13, 14. Keep your mind on the race. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, but let's say what happens. There's anything out there that you're minded in, that you think about, rather than your mind and thinking, striving for perfection uh, in the race going forward, getting the prize. What happens then? God, this is encouraging, all right? This is one of the verses you want to mark down that will encourage you in life. God shall reveal even this unto you. God's going to reveal it to you that you're out of the race, that you're not following His will. Now, this is very encouraging. Go to Acts 16. Acts 16. Now, some of you, you're just serving God the best way you know how. Now, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You're zealous, right? You're going forward. Man, I'm going to do this for the Lord. I'm going to do that for the Lord. And then what happens is you make mistakes, right? right. You go overzealous and then it lacks wisdom. And then you feel discouraged and downtrodden, right? Right, right? So then this verse should encourage you. The verse should encourage you that, hey, that's not something to be discouraged about. Because if you keep pressing forward, and what happens? The mindset is, what if I make a mistake? What if I'm outside the will of God? I'm paranoid. I'm fearful. It's God's job to send you the correction. See? So don't worry about when your mind's striving for perfection, but then your mind gets off balance out of perfection, God's going to reveal it to you. When He reveals it to you, then it should make you happy. Why should you be happy? Because if you kept going down forward, forward, but out of the perfection, out of balance of perfection, and going the wrong direction, and God never told you, then you would have wasted your time working for the Lord in the wrong path. So it should encourage you when the Lord gives you correction along the way. That's His job. Well, pastor, I'm afraid if I make this decision, what if it's God's will? Hey, don't worry about if it's not God's will or not. I tell nearly everybody when I counsel, the Lord will show it to you. He's not the type of God that says, okay, you're trying your best to find my will. I can't wait for you to slip up. Just one time, one time, yes, bam, wham. That don't make sense. He's not that type of God. Look at Acts 16. Here's a great example. Look at Acts chapter 16. Notice that Paul, he's trying to go by the will of God. But then when you read verse uh, 8, And they passing by uh, my Mysia, I think that's how you pronounce it, <laughs> came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Look at the previous verse at Acts 16, verse 6. Acts 16, verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they, came, uh, they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So notice right here, Paul, he's trying to serve God and planning another church, getting souls saved and preach the gospel. But the Holy Spirit got him out of there. He corrected him. Don't go there. Don't go there. Well, where do I go? God will reveal it to you. God showed it to Paul, right? Go to Macedonia. So that's what's going to happen. That's the Lord's job. Uh, look at Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Here's a bigger encouragement. A bigger encouragement is... Let's say you deliberately go out of the path of perfection. You say, I'm going to rebel against God. I'm not going to race. I'm going to go my own way. When that happens, you should still be encouraged because God still will correct you. Isn't that encouraging? Yes, he's going to chastise you and get you in the right path. That's his job. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. And then we'll look at verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So see, that's uh, if earthly fathers, which they're not sadly doing it now, but if earthly fathers would chasten and correct their children and punish them, much more so the Heavenly Father will do that for you. So that should encourage you. Let's go back to Philippians 3. 
So Philippians 3.15 is a verse that you probably would even want to memorize because it will encourage you when you're going down a wrong path or a path you're not sure if it's uh, the right decision to make. Listen, don't worry about the right decisions to make, especially during this coronavirus situation. Don't let other people judge you or pastors or churches judge you. If you're truly trying to go by what the Word of God says, and there's a lot of things where we have to abide by Romans 14 on convictions now, right? The job of the church is not to judge the person for his or her conviction or his or her freedom even, their free choice. So we don't do that. Just go by, Lord, I don't know if this is the right decision to make. Oh, I'm pressured. I'm stressed out. Hey, just go by how God deals with you. I don't judge other pastors and churches what they're doing in their restrictions or how they're following or not following or etc. I don't do that. And I don't do that with my members too. I only do it if it contradicts plainly the Word of God. But guess what? In these kind of situations, Romans 14, there are things the Word of God don't say. So we shouldn't panic. I shouldn't panic in my decisions as a pastor either. I shouldn't let other pastors or let up my own people in my church or people out there online judge me. I just go by what God wants me to do and He'll correct me, not pastor so-and-so, not troll so-and-so, and not member so-and-so. And guess what? Not you. And you can say that about that too. All right? Just let God correct and guide you. Don't worry. All right? As long as you're trying to seek after God's will. Now, obviously, if it blatantly goes against the Word of God, then obviously you're in the wrong. And you know that too. But in those cases where the Lord doesn't really show you and you feel abstract or in the dark, guess what? God will show you step by step. Okay? So don't fear. Don't let other people judge you. Don't be discouraged. Okay? I certainly don't with what people are doing to me now. All right, let's go back to Philippians 3. Philippians 3. God's going to show it to you. If God shows it to you, then why are you worried about? Thank you, Lord. All right? Thank you. I think your problem is you just don't believe that God will show it to you. You just don't believe it. Or if you're in the dark and you make this decision, I think this is the right decision, but I don't know. Hey, the Lord's going to honor it if you think it's the right decision. Right. Okay? All right, let's go to verse 16. Nevertheless, so Paul's saying, nevertheless, so even though you go, uh, so he's saying, nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Okay, so let me explain every word here. So basically, he's saying, verse 15, if you go out of course, Nevertheless, we should try to stay on course, right? That's why he put nevertheless there. So nevertheless, where to, so where to, meaning where and to, okay? Where you're going towards, right? Where to, we have already attained, right? We attained it already. When we got saved, when we're in Christ Jesus, we already attained it. We're already perfect. But let's keep walking. Let us keep walking, right? Let's go, go up. The different levels here of perfection, the attaining. Let's attain more. Let us at walk by the same rule. Okay, so Paul's saying all of us when we're in this race, we should be following the same rule together. Keep reading. Let us mind the same thing. We have to put our mind on the same thing together. That is extremely important. What is extremely important is we try to do this in unity. You can even do it with differences too, you know that? Like I told you before, uh, everyone might have their own race to run, own conviction, Romans 14, but Romans 14 still shows the unity in there. It says what? We don't judge each other on that. And then everyone, we must strive to serve God together. So, here's the thing, is that uh, we have to be same mind, no matter what. So even in differences, we can maintain the same mind together. What's that? Don't judge each other. Leave everyone in their own conviction. And then we should be in the same mind on what? When things are clear in Scripture, not just a different conviction, this is clear in Scripture, doctrine, sin, worldliness, etc. When it's clear in Scripture, we have to put our mind in the same thing. But if people don't follow that rule, then guess what? You're not for unity, you're for disunity. You're the divider. 
Now look at Galatians 6. We're going to look at Galatians 6. Paul, he wants peace. And he wants unity. But this comes by following rules, okay? Not with no rules. That's the problem with non-denominational churches. No rules, right? Come as you are. Doctrines don't make a big deal. That's their problem. No, we go by rules here. Galatians chapter 6. Notice verse 16. And as many as walk, according to this rule, peace be on them. See that? Matching with Philippians. When we walk, we have to walk according to the rule. So the, you cannot have a good Christian walk without rules. Did you hear what I just said? Let me repeat that again. Because there's a bunch of these wow wow churches that don't get that. Oh, I have a good Christian walk. Why are you judging me? Yeah, I judge you if you don't have rules. If you don't have standards, you're legalist. No, I ain't legalist. That's scripture. In your Christian walk, if you don't got rules, you got a problem, man. Yeah, we got rules here. If you have, if you can't not be a Christian who's successfully walking with Jesus Christ if you don't have rules. If you don't have rules on the way you dress, you don't have rules on the music you listen to, you don't have rules with the things that you watch, the things that you taste, act, see, smell, put on, or hear. See, that's the point. It's not music and dressing. It's with what you do with your body. You don't got rules on that, and anything goes... That's why you listen to that contemporary music garbage. That's the reason why you dress up like the world and stuff like that. That's what happens, see? You got no rules for how they appear, what they hear, what they see, what they smell, what they taste, what they do with their bodies for the Lord. Alright, now go back to uh, Philippians again. Verse 17. So 16 and 17, I'm going to comment on this together. The Bible says, brethren, so brothers and sisters in Christ again, he's addressing, be followers together of me. Paul saying, you have to follow me, what I do. And mark them which walk so. So if there are people you notice who walk so, like Paul, then mark them, keep an eye on them, target them, all right? So as he have us for an example. So Paul is saying, me and my crowd, we're in a good example of that, so mark it down. Okay, now this is very important. This is where people accuse me for being divisive and, you know, oh, you're a Ruckmanite and garbage like that. Look, that's not, that's their problem. Their problem is, is that, oh, you're following a man, you're following a man. No, it's not a following a man, it's following Jesus Christ. But you ha if you have no man to follow and you proclaim that you follow Jesus Christ, guess what? You're your own man. That's one, un one thing I noticed. That's your problem. You're your own man then. But you have to follow men and not follow men, period. You have to follow men who follow Christ. If you follow men, then you're sinning, all right? If you follow Ruckman, you're sinning. You're following me, you're sinning. If you follow Ruckman who follows Christ, then you're in the right. If you follow me when I follow Christ, you're in the right. Oh, I, I don't follow any man. You're in the wrong, all right? You're not in the right, all right? You have to have... That's a command in Scripture. Mark them. You have to mark down people who follow Christ. And Paul is so arrogant to say followers of me. Why? Because he said, uh, I guess I'll have to justify this. Okay, look at the book of Corinthians, all right? 1 Corinthians 11 and then 1. The Bible says, be followers of me. See, Paul, that's what he said. You follow men even as I also am of Christ. See? So what do I do? This is simple, all right? You know, uh, there, uh, there is such a thing as a crowd. All right, you want to follow the right crowd. If you don't believe in following a right crowd and you're arrogant to say, well, I just follow Jesus Christ. No, you're your own man. You're a rebel. That's how I see it as. The Bible's command is that what is the church? It's a, it's a called out assembly. God wants you to stay with an assembly, not your own and say, oh, I follow Jesus. See, that's been church history past 2,000 years. All right, how do I... Uh, what do I know is a real Bible believer or as best of a Bible believer as you go? What you do is you don't go your own way and then start correcting Bible believing men that the Lord has used and pretend you're so smart. I'm sick and tired of these people. 
all right and calling themselves bible believers too i'm sick and tired of these people i'm so tempted to call out names but i'm not going to call out names on this one all right but some of these people it makes me stinking mad they're big hypocrites and they steal from bible believing preachers they learn their materials and then they correct them and then they make their own little thing like i'm a smart guy you know oh i don't follow men i follow jesus christ no you're prideful of yourself saying i follow jesus and you want people to see that of you and pretend that you're so humble i don't like that all right me i follow men all right as long as they follow christ why because i want to keep myself in line stupid I don't want to say, oh yeah, I follow Jesus Christ, and then I start correcting men of God who also follow Christ. That makes me, that makes me a stinking prideful person. Yeah, that's right. So then, what do I do? It's simple. I look at men who follow Christ, and Christ used mightily. When I see them, then I go, okay, this is my crowd. So then me follows here. It's that simple right well what if they do something that uh goes against christ simple then in those areas i just follow christ and the areas they're following christ i follow them that's that simple okay but i want to follow them best men i don't want to just pick and choose panorama on my men i have to pick the best group the best crowd because evil communications corrupt good manners and paul says you have to mark down your friends when you choose your right friends, then what happens? You get influenced by the right friends. And then you talk, you act like them. The thing as uh, now this is just me. Other Bible believer believing preachers, they do things differently. And, you know, Lord bless them for that. I don't judge them for that. Some of them I kind of do. But me as a Bible believing pastor, I only hang around Bible believing preachers who agree like I do. Now, there are some things that we may disagree upon, but the things that I've learned from Dr. Ruppman's school, I go by those people who agree like I do from those main big doctrines that we learn from the school. That's the kind of crowd that I stick to. You might say, why? Because I'm marking those who are the closest to Christ. And I hang around those guys a lot. I think it did me good. You might say, how did it do you good? I, I seem to pastor a church successfully in the Bay Area compared to other people who compromise. And then I know a lot of doctrine compared to a lot of other pastors here who don't know a lot of doctrine. I stand against the liberals on their ground, unlike all the other pastors who can. Why? Because I hung around my crowd. They influenced me. They protected me over with the higher education system of the world there. If I was with that IFB crowd, I would have fallen flat real fast. See, so that's why you have to pick your people. All right? I believe in following men. All right? That's why I make friends with Bible believing preachers out there. That's why I don't grow a beard and stay alone in the woods and pretend that I follow Jesus Christ. Oh, let's have a prayer war. Oh, like that. I don't act like that. That's that's filled with pride. Prideful people. Prideful people. All right? All right. Uh if we go over here, so we have to, I uh, have to cover two more verses. There are a lot of verses here that I have to cover quickly. Um, we have to look at 2 Thessalonians 2 and Romans 16. 2 Thessalonians 2, Romans 16. Oh my goodness, I don't have time. Ephesians 4. Okay, let's do this quickly. I'm going to do this. I'm going to crunch the time. We have to do this quickly. Romans 16. Ephesians 4, and then I also want you to turn to uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. Notice the wording here matches with Philippians. Now, people, see, when I talk like this, it makes me divisive. Oh, Brother Kim, you're so divisive. You know, you're saying like you're a real Bible believer. And there are many other good godly preachers who are just as Bible believing, you know. They may not know as much doctrine as you do, but you're pretty arrogant and you're overtly divisive. No, what you got to understand is those people are divisive. You might say, why? Because Paul's saying this. The point is this. The point is, we're supposed to strive for perfection, right? What's the men and the group that's the most perfect in doctrine, in practice? Once you pick those people, you have to be unified with them. 
And then what you have to do is anyone who tries to ruin that unity, you have to mark them and, and you have to cut them off and split and divide from that. Yes, that's scripture. That's what you have to do. All right? Now, I'm not going to go as so far as to say to cut off from every IFB pastor. I'm not going to go that far. But the point is this. The point of the lesson, there's no doubt from these scriptures. The point of the scripture is this. You have to find a crowd that follows the most perfectly with Jesus Christ. In doctrine, in practice. Once you find that crowd, your job is not to play politics and jump around and mess with different crowds. You have to stick to that crowd and stay unified with them and unified in the differences of convictions in Romans 14. Overlook that. Stay unified with them and anyone who tries to put that division, you have to be distant from them. You have to mark that and cut it off. Why? Because they're destroying our unity of real Bible believers. We're not the ones destroying that unity of Bible believers. Okay, if you don't believe me, look at the passage, okay? I know that's divisive, but look at this. Ephesians 4. Look at verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Right? We have to keep this unity. But what's ruining this? Look at this. Look at verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. See that? That's unifying. We have to go as the most perfect. What follows? Wrong doctrine 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness. See, we make a big deal on doctrine. Okay, look at Romans 16. Romans 16. See, so Paul argued for you. I told you my interpretation is correct from these verses. If you want to be unity as Bible believers, we have to stay right there and mark those. Mark those who are contradicting those doctrines. Look at Romans 16. Look at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them. See, you have to mark those, not just those that are good, but mark those that are bad. That's causing the divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Now look at 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3. Look at this. The Bible says at verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. Right? Remember this Christian walk? There are rules and we have to strive for perfection. If there's anything that goes disorderly against it, then you have to separate and not after the tradition which he received of us for yourselves know how we ye ought to follow us see paul so arrogant isn't he for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you and notice right here at verse 11 for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly look at uh, verse 14 and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, see, mark him down, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now that's an important verse. This shows also we're not enemies, okay? But we have to admonish them because they're our brother in Christ. So I don't care if Doug Stoffer, yeah, I named him. So I don't care if Doug Stoffer, like, I don't know why these Bible-believing churches won't invite me to preach for them. And, you know, they're, they're just so disorderly and they're just so unloving and they're causing overt divisions and nitpicking. No, that's our job because you're my brother in Christ. And because you don't follow what I do and what I teach with my church and my crowd who does that, that's why we separate from you. I'm sorry. Why? You're not my enemy, but you're my brother. See, that's how we should act, okay? I act that way. And I'm sick and tired of people doing, uh, pretending that, like, oh, you know, I'm just like you. No, you ain't like me on that one. You ain't like me on that one, okay? So that's the reason why we have to follow along with that. All right, P.S. James Knox. I included him, too. Let's close with the word of prayer. I'm so much in trouble. I'm so much in trouble. Let's pray. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings have... Uh, not offended or shocked the people, especially the Bible-believing crowd. I pray that they'll have maturity, uh, that they will see something, there's something truthful right here, and that we'll stay in it together. 
and that we'll be unified as Bible believers, not divided and be nitpicky about, you know, what is being taught tonight. We should be unified and agree on this one, Lord, and separate those that are causing the separation and division, Lord. Help us be strong as Bible believers and real Bible believers striving for perfection. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.